Okay, then let's get going. I hope everyone is still awake after eating lunch. Um, so welcome in the room, welcome on the internet. Um, we will talk today about security, not only for OpenSUSE developers, but a bit of uh, stuff that I will show is rather specific to OpenSUSE, so it's a perfect match here. And uh, tell me if I drop the mic too low, because I'm not really used to holding these things. So, first a quick introduction. So my name is Johannes Segitz. I'm a member of the SUSE security team. Um, there I do code review, not that much nowadays, but at least I used to do this. I do a bit of uh, product pen testing. Um, I'm the go-to guy for SLinux Linux to some extent, and I lead the internal red team. Um, the outline for today, um, first I will give you a quick introduction to the SUSE security team. This is my usual uh, talk starter, and this time it's pretty easy because they're basically all in the room here. <laughs> so we can have a show of hands or something like that. Um, then I will show you some interesting ways of hacking not only OpenSUSE developers, and then I will give you some general security recommendations on how to change your setup to avoid being hacked. So, the SUSE security team, our team lead, uh, Stojan, sitting here. Then we have two groups in the team. We have the reactive group, which does mostly incident handling for known security issues, so the usual CVE stuff that pops up uh, needs a fix. And this is done by Marcus, Alexander, Robert, Gianluca, Kathy, Carlos, Gabriele, Martin, and Thomas, which are distributed with him here in the room. So it makes a lot of sense to introduce them. <laughs> and then there's so-called proactive group um, where Matthias, Wolfgang, Paolo, Filippo, and I work. And there we do a lot of the work that we do before shipment. And a lot of that is really concentrating on code audits. So every time you introduce a set UID binary, we want to have a look. Um, there are recorded talks about this work uh, that we do there. If you're interested, then just have a look in the archives. Um, and you probably, if you ship some code that runs privilege in some shape or form, have been in contact with us anyway. Uh, I like that comic because that is a common way how security teams behave. We really try not to be this way. Uh, to a certain extent, that's kind of unavoidable because you have to tell people, well, that's not great and that's not great. But if you see us acting like that, then please tell us or go, go to Stojan and uh, snitch on us, <laughs> and then we try to behave differently. So, why do we talk about this? Um, you've all heard supply chains attacks become more prominent all the time. Uh, this is in the news, this is something that we are very aware of all, and this is becoming a bigger problem more and more, and this will also not end. Um, unfortunately, the bad guys are becoming pretty professional nowadays. So they basically act like corporations. There is a certain group that is responsible for one part of the attack chain, a certain group responsible for another part of the attack chain. And attacking early in the chain is a good way for them to maximize their profits. So if they manage to compromise a software package, then they don't have to attack individual systems. They can just own all the systems that install this package. No? You and your workstations are part of this root of trust. Yeah? So if your developer workstation is compromised, <coughs> then it's very hard to mitigate this later in the chain. Yeah? You can have signed commits and whatever, and we can do code audits, but if someone does it in a very clever way, then it's unlikely that you will notice that directly. So that's the reason why it's really important for us to make sure that developer workstations are secured properly. As a recent example that popped up one or two weeks ago, so the developer of this noise torch tool got his uh, development machine compromised and then basically uh, canned his whole product, uh, his whole project, um, because he can't really tell if it was compromised or not. Um, I mean, he acted in a very responsible way, but of course it's not the greatest way to become known on the internet. So you probably don't want to be this guy. No? Um, some assumptions about the attacker, because if you want to defend against something, you first need to know what you're actually defending against. Yeah? So distribution is definitely a high value target. Yeah? We are a nice multiplier. If you manage to compromise a package in a distribution, then you own a lot of machines. So the assumptions is that there are organized groups out there that would be interested in compromising us or your workstation. They are capable and equipped and might be state funded. No. And also, they are not only out for the short attack, they might also invest just a bit more time. 
this is also a problem for communities because they might invest time to become a community member. No? I'm not showing any high-end attacks here. No? It's pretty clear that if a three-letter agency wants to attack you, they can probably do it and you can't really defend against it. But I will show you some things that might surprise you or not. And I think it's time to up our security game a bit to stay ahead, ahead of the pack. Um, in general, this is still the attacker you need to be aware of. Uh, so there are definitely organized and funded groups that can earn a lot of money by compromising a workstation like yours. And it might not happen directly, but this is a real threat nowadays. So now we go to the game show part of the game uh, of this talk here. So we play now, will this compromise your workstation? So you check out some random Git repository, enter into the directory and type make. So show of hands, is your account now compromised? Please show your hand if you think it's compromised now. That's good that you think that. <laughs> and now we go to the uh, part where I show you this. So this is really, really easy because you have direct command execution at this point. Uh, invoking make just executes everything that's in the make file. If something malicious is in the make file, then it's done. There are many, many ways to compromise uh, you that way. So just compiling software is basically something dangerous you should not do directly in your primary account. So um, I have a Podman container for that. I enter here. Um, I'm listed here as root, but you probably all know how, how Podman works, so I'm not really root. So let me go in there. We have this bar repository. It's just something random that I uh, cloned. And now if I list the temporary directory, currently there's nothing in there. I type make and let it compile quickly. At least it compiled quickly when I tried it last time. If I list the temp directory again, I see that this file owned is created. And if I have a look here, then I see that I have uh, code execution as the user here. And the trick is pretty easy. You just have this config file in here. And if you list this, then you see that this FS monitor um, statement that allows you to configure which files are considered when you uh, type JIT status and similar commands is executed. And it just generates this file. So this is something where the JIT developers are currently thinking about how to resolve all of this, but this is probably not something you would have suspected. No? 
it can become worse. So let me exit the container and go in here again. I'm personally a happy user of set shell and I use all my set shell. Um, that has a nice JIT integration. So again, have a look at the temp directory. Nothing is in here. Now I go into the bad uh, repository. And if I now list the temp directory again, the file is already there without me doing anything. And if I then cat the file, I see that this code was executed multiple times. So all of this nifty automation that you have in the background that you see directly if the JIT repository is dirty, causes code execution in the background without you doing anything. No? If you have more advanced setups, this can become even more problematic, but here really did nothing apart from just entering the directory. Okay, so next one. This is something that you are probably very familiar when you are an OpenSUSE developer. So um, you just check out some package, you go in there, and then you use Quilt to unpack the sources. And I don't know if every one of you is aware of Quilt. It's a tool that helps you to unpack sources and apply patches. It's not problematic if you like have one patch, but if you have a mm, package that has 100 patches, then it becomes very tedious to do this by hand. Quilt is very convenient in helping you there. So again, show of hands, is your uh, account now compromised? And you might see a pattern to this game. <laughs> Okay, so let's give it a try. Again, we enter a Podman container. We already have checked out the sources here. And let's have a look at the temp directory. Currently, nothing is in here. We go in here. And it looks basically like any other source, uh, sources you would see in the build service. And if we now type quilt setup and the spec file, then it prepares unpacking the sources. And so we have now a directory in here where we have the sources and where we can apply all the patches and do all of the nifty things that Quilts allows us to do. But if we now look at the temp directory, we now have this own file again. And the reason here is pretty simple. In the spec file, um, you also can have arbitrary commands and Quilt uses these commands when it tries to recreate the sources. So this is something that I do basically every day and we're just executing this innocent command can cause a problem. And at least I don't read every spec file from top to bottom until I do this. So this is a problem. No? Okay. So Quilt is executing the commands directly from the spec file. Again, you don't need to do anything fancy. You just write the commands you want to execute in there and it's done. So let's up our game. Again, we just check out some sources and we try to build them locally. So I prepared a demo here. Show of hands who thinks that their account or their machine is now compromised. Yeah. So it depends a little bit. So if you have the default setup where you use a tree root for building, and you have a certain service installed, which you will probably install because otherwise you get an error message and then you are a nice guy and install the service, then this causes code execution as root on your system. So not as a local uh, user, but you get root code execution here. So we can demo this also. And here we are not in a, a Podman container. This is a VM because um, the next step we need VMs and VMs. So if you grab for the build type in the OSCRC file, then we see currently nothing is configured and the default is then to build in a JRoot. So let us go in here and let's have a look at the um, root directory. Currently nothing is in here. And now we type OSC build. And now it takes a while. I hope that it actually works because it worked 15 minutes ago type in your root password to allow the uh, JRoot setup to happen. And it's just a run of the mill package. It takes a while until this is now completed. But the damage should already be done. So if I now list the root file system, I see now there is a 
root own file created on their this own file here. The reason why this works is that a JRoot is not really a security boundary. Uh, there are many techniques to break out of a JRoot and here I just entered a small file in here that is helpfully named uh, for what it does. So it breaks out of the JRoot and then it places a flag file. And this is all triggered with this service here. <coughs> the replace using env service has this very helpful evil command. And if you work with security, you know that every time you see evil in some shape or form, it's almost always a really, really bad thing to see. And it basically just takes the file that is uh, in here, makes it executable, and then just executes this file, which breaks out of the JRoot, and then executes code as a root on your host system. So that would not allow you only executing code as your user, which is usually bad enough, but it will fully compromise your machine. So, next one. So now you watch the talk and you became very, very concerned and you took my recommendation and switched to KVM building. So we have another demo, um, you now build again. So question, is your account now compromised? I mean, if I ask, then it probably is, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me show you that. So, First, we switch the build type in the configuration file. Now, if you grab again for it, we set it to KVM. So that means that we will now spin up a KVM virtual machine to build in there, and that should be safe. So we basically just do the same as before, and if I type it correctly, then it also works. This will now be a little bit slower because this is now in a virtual machine. And I type in the root password again, and once this is done, uh, already uh, spoiled a little bit, we will see that we now have code execution as a user, because these services can be used in various ways. The first service, we actually trigger the execution of the service within the JRoot to break out. But you don't necessarily have to do this, you can also just execute the service w before the build happens as the user directly. <coughs> So if we now look at the temp directory, we have this own file. You just have to believe me that it was not there before. And um, the reason here is that again, we abuse the service here and you can use this evil command and it looks very similar to what we had before. The only difference really here is the service mode. So local only and for it was build time. So build time means it basically executes in the build environment. Local only means that it executes, executes before the build happens. <coughs> Uh, now this should be your local user. Yeah. So the only code execution where we really became root was the earlier example where we had this JRoot breakout. Here, um, the build itself is now done in a secure way in a virtual machine, but the service itself runs as my user before that happens. And it's also fully transparent for you. I mean, you can obviously look at the service file, but you probably don't do this every time before you build something. Um, at least I don't, and even if you would do it, I mean, this here is pretty obvious, but you can obfuscate it nicely and create some big script that apparently does something useful and then hides the bad stuff. Yeah, so again, code execution as a user and it still needs the service, but this is a pretty weak limitation because first of all, most developers probably install a lot of these services and even if not, then you would see an error message that you need to install the package and well, most people then do this. So, <coughs> I hope that was entertaining and also a bit surprising at times. The question is now what you do against this. So in general, you need to have as much separation and least privilege as possible. Separation means that you should not use one account for everything. I know it's extremely convenient to do this, but if you don't separate, then pretty much everything that uh, executes under a user account can compromise everything else. And least privilege means that you try to run operations only with the privileges that are necessary. So for example, if you compile software, it's not 
needed usually that this software is able to access your whole home directory. No? It's usually okay to just access read only certain parts of the file system, so like the system libraries, and have read write access to the place where you're actually compiling the software. Everything else should not be available. And this needs to be a principle that you strive for to really limit things as far as I know. And I know from a convenience perspective that's not great. Um, but if you don't do this, then the software that you compile basically can steal your money if you also do online banking with your account. No? So it's a good motivation. It's not only your users that get hacked, it's also your money that's gone. Security quite often is really mostly a matter of mindset. So first of all, you need to be aware that this is a problem, but then also you need to care because security most often is not much about convenience. So if you have to deal with inconvenience, most people can only bear that if they really see a reason. And for that, you need to change your mindset that it becomes important for you to stay secure. So also still on a high level, what do you do for that? So you should create an environment that is distinct from your normal environment in which you work as a normal user. So you can use different Linux users if you like. <coughs> Um, you can con use containers or namespacing tools. Um, I mean, containers basically are just different combinations of namespacing, and there are really nice tools that you can use nowadays to set up various namespaces, though that not all privileges are available at all times. Then VMs are a good thing. Um, VMs probably offer the strongest protection because you don't share the kernel. This is also the setup that I use. Um, when I audit software, I clone a new VM and just work in there. Um, for this to work, you need to automate this. So if you don't automate this, and if this is cumbersome for you, then unless you are completely different than I am, you will probably not do it permanently. No? So invest the time once to create a setup where basically one command gives you a new environment that you can throw away. And if you get to this point, then the chances are high that you actually use it. If you need to do a lot of manual steps, then you will probably not do this on a permanent basis. So the simpler the use, the better and the more secure. No? Simplicity is usually a really good thing in security, especially if you tend to be like me and are not that keen on having additional steps of work. An important thing to consider is that you need to prevent persistence. So um, there are, of course, attackers where like having this code execution once already spilled the beans and you're basically screwed forever but quite often they try to get some form of persistence and then use it to move from your machine or gain additional targets. If you have an environment like a container or whatever where the malicious code runs in there, but then the container vanishes again and does not run permanently, then the chances are rather high that you will not be affected by this problem on a permanent basis. It's not a guarantee, but the shorter lifetime, the better usually. So. On low-level recommendations, the first thing you really should do is to switch to KVM building. Um, there are other build types. I did not really try Xen or whatever because I don't have the environment for that, but really move away from the straight root builds and move to co uh, KVM builds. On most modern hardware, it should not be too painful from a, persp uh, from a performance perspective, and this gives you already quite a good um, boost in security here. Then for tooling, I would recommend that you familiarize yourself with some form of namespacing tool. So I personally like NSJL. I know that we ship bubble wrap as a tool. These allow you to set up namespaces for various things. So not sharing the PID namespace or giving a process a different look on the file system. No? And with a bit of automation, it becomes easy to make sure that uh, certain commands only have access to what they really need. And one example here is this SQLT uh, wrapper that um, I wrote that basically is a transparent wrapper around Quilt. And if you then install it for you, then um, this will create dynamic configurations with NF NSJL to ensure that Quilt only has access to what it needs to do. No? So it still can mess around in the sources and whatever but it has no need to read your private SSH key. There's just no justification that this thing is visible to this tool when it's running. 
This is a short example of how this NSJL configuration looks like. You specify certain parts that are mounted. So here you mount certain binaries. You don't make them writable. And then the RPM, uh, RPM build directory in which you work, you make writable. There's a bit more logic around it, but in the end, it's really a simple wrapper. And you can easily create something like that for your use case that you often run. Uh, and this is a really nice thing because with that thing, I have it running now for a couple of years, I don't notice it at all. So if you do that in a clever way, then you can have more security without having the inconvenience. So Quilt is using this dynamically generated um, configuration and then just runs normal Quilt like this. And this then has this very limited view on the system and can't really harm you. So why do I give this talk? This is a warning towards all of you. Um, I think that came clearly across to some extent, but the reason why I warn you is that we are used for other users getting hacked. No? So it has been the case for quite a long time that like all of our grandparents and parents got hacked left and right because they don't know how to deal with all of this stuff. But most people in this room probably did not have the problem because we were always one step ahead. We were the people that used the password manager. We were the people that had unique uh, passwords for accounts and stuff like that. So we were not the targets that were really reached by most attackers. And this is now changing. No? The attackers realize that compromising a de developer workstation gives them a lot of power to then influence uh, other machines. And in a time where you can make a lot of money with ransomware and crypto tro trojans and whatever, um, this is becoming a more interesting target. And so we need to step up our game. Having a password manager was now fine for 10 years. Now we need to step up a little bit to not get screwed. And you really don't want to be this guy that wrote on GitHub, well, my machine got compromised. Please throw away everything I wrote in the last 10 years. That is not an awesome feeling. So now they are coming after you. <laughs> and now I actually... I incl included at least one picture into my very text-heavy presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you appreciate it. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have questions, you can either ask me now or I will be available on the conference at least today and tomorrow. And if you have later on questions, you can reach the security team at security at suse.de. We are also available on Slack if you want to contact us about the best way in our old school way is to reach us via email, I would say. So thanks again, and do you have questions? Like that? We don't, and I mean, this can definitely happen, but I think for most people don't really expect that just entering a directory, if you have something like, oh, my set shall activate it, allows the, your uh, account to be compromised. So it does not change the underlying problem that we have the issue that we basically need to trust software to some extent. I just want to show that even if you don't install the software, but just check out the sources and go to a directory, this can already be enough. So we need to step up on every uh, level of the game here. That also means that we probably need to figure out a better way to review software, but this is a problem where I don't have any solution. That's why I did not do a talk about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Definitely. Yeah. I think. I've talked to them and asked them to include something like that. The problem is that you need some namespacing setup helper to run this. Okay. And they didn't want to pull this in as a dependency. And also, for me, this works flawlessly. But there are other people that use Quilt in different ways. And there were people that actually ran into issues. I think they can mostly be solved. But I think that it for probably 95% of people, this is a drop-in replacement where they will not notice a problem. But the other 5% are probably going to cause issues for Quilt upstream, so they were not very keen on taking this. <coughs> but in general, we also need to change the way how we work here. I mean, this is this one tool, but in general, you need to separate your work environments as uh, far as possible. And then you can also just if you use c containers for building and throw them away after that and only take the artifacts out of that, then maybe you don't need this wrapper because you solve this in a different uh, different area. But for Quilt, I would definitely recommend it because, I mean, it's painless. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, because services are really convenient. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but so we try to get the default build away from the jailroot configuration. Um, that is still ongoing effort, I think, for the services. We could think about maybe looking, so we reviewed the services and we have a couple of bugs open to for dangerous functionality in there that we might want to remove. For example, this Evo thingy. Question is if we really want to have something like that. But this is also really not intended as like highlighting this one thing and if we fix that, then we are secure. You just need to shift your whole thinking around that. Because if you like solve that problem, then there will be a different problem where that you did not consider so you need to have the separation in any case. And then the question is, make, does it make sense to hunt after individual instances of getting compromised this or that way? Um, you probably. Yeah. But for example, I, I really like the use case you just showed that I'm running something which, for example, I want to use Docker and I want to run on a stream which is not packaged yet and I will package it and I will use it in the use case mm -hmm. to get it on a, on a roller in a Linux machine. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, you should probably do the packaging also in some form of virtual machine. And I, I agree with you, it would be nice to have more secure defaults there. We are also pushing for that. But it's not like security is always the highest priority all the time everywhere. Yeah, and here, even if we would fix that, I mean, like if you compile the software, you probably are, there are other ways to compromise you. So you probably need a separated environment for doing these packaging tests anyway. No? I can't tell you because I did not check. Um, and this is something, so for example, the services, if they run the services, you could probably use the same vector there. Um, I I mean, JRoot is known to be weak. It's not really a surprise. It's not like novel research or anything. You can basically Google 10 ways of breaking out of a JRoot. With containers, it's different because the expectation is also that you can't do this. Yeah? So this is not a security vulnerability that will be fixed because it's just an intended as a security boundary for um, containers, it's differently. But with that, I end, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> So if you still have questions, just approach me on the conference and I'm happy to continue the discussion. Thank you very much for being here.